my video and oops. Um, Pat's on her way as well. She'll be here. I'm going to have to get out and come back in, I think. Okay. Oh, you're muted. We have a quorum. Thank you, Athena. It is July 9, 2024. This is, and it is uh, a regular meeting of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council. And I'm gonna call the meeting to order at 6.34 p.m. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by chapter 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, and extended again by chapter two of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public is possible, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time being via technological means. Let's go around and see if everyone can be heard. Councillor Ette. Yes, and yes. I can hear you. Um, Jennifer. Yes, I'm here. And Rooney is here and, and can finally be heard. And we have Councillor DeAngelis. Can you hear us? Pat, can you hear? Yes, I can hear. I just Excellent. got there. I'm sorry. I fell asleep. <laughs> I'm well, old. <laughs> we're glad you're here. And, we're glad and it's you're very ready. hot. <laughs> I believe Councillor Henneke is not going to be here tonight, so we are going to proceed. Um, there is no public hearing tonight, but I do want to open it to public comment, and we will limit um, comments to... Um, to three minutes. We've got two people in the audience. And if either Arlie or Steve Roof would like to say something, um, you're free to do that now. Raise your hand, please, and we'll bring you in. Arlie, why don't you join us? Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, First of all, I want to say thank you to uh, Councillor Rooney for her uh, contributions at the Jones Library Building Committee uh, meeting. Um, and I'm this is the first time I'm coming to this group, and it's because I'm interested in what to hear what you're talking about with the solar bylaw. So I will be listening closely for that. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to get the popular bylaw as the second agenda item. Uh, any other, anyone else want to uh, make public comment? I don't see any more hands. So let's, let's continue on. Um, our action items tonight are the nuisance bylaw, and you all have received or have seen in the packet the, um, the latest clean version. Um, I have asked specifically that Chief Ting and Building Commissioner Mora be available to help us iron out the last couple of questions that we had, uh, in part as I was um, doing that final cleanup. Uh, a couple of things just struck me that I thought we should probably address. And then also I got comments from Councillor Haneke, who's not able to be here tonight. We will try to uh, address her, um, her questions. And I am going to try to uh, screen sh share. And tell me if it's, tell me if you're seeing it. Are you seeing it? Mm -hmm. Okay. And can I, I will try to make it as big as I can and tell me when to stop because I can't see it on my screen. Just um, here. So we're going to go through, we, we 
got through the bulk of that of this material last time, and I, I'm going to just section by section ask if there are any questions or any additional comments uh, as we go through um, section A purpose. Section B definitions. And I'm I'm going to raise my hand for section B number seven. Can you see it on your screen? Okay. Um, you also you also could look at our packet and the same document is there if you want to see it larger. So number seven uh, under B is response costs. Um, and it states the cost associated with responses by law enforcement, inspection, fire, and other emergency response providers to a complaint received for a violation of this bylaw is set forth in a schedule of costs established by the town manager. And I would like to call on Chief Ting for a response and also um, Commissioner Mora. I can start first. So um, I'll be honest with you, I'm not too in favor of a schedule of costs because uh, whenever we respond to any type of call or emergency, um, you know, how do you segregate, you know, a nuisance call from every other call to be able to establish that uh, costs need to be inferred because of our response versus all the other hundreds of other calls that we go to. So I just think it's kind of a slippery slope to start charging any folks uh, additional monies for a general response that we would do anyways. The question might be then, do we, do we eliminate this in this particular bylaw? I know that we have something similar in the rental registration bylaw, and perhaps um, commissioner can can address that. But uh, Rob, yeah. So we similarly, we don't you know charge or um, have a fee schedule for just general response uh, reinspection fees. Uh, those are outlined in certain um, by, through certain bylaws or codes. Uh, and we are actually, you know, not allowed to charge for response for anything related to health and safety under the sanitary code. Uh, you know, if there's a complaint filed by a tenant, as an example. Uh, so I don't, uh, from my end, I don't think I need to have, I've never heard the town manager suggest that we should establish any kind of uh, fee for, you know, off hours response or, uh, our our standard response whenever there's a, a situation. So I think at this time I don't I don't see that it's needed. Any any uh, CRC members want to um, weigh in or suggest how to handle this? Pat? Yeah, I'm I'm listening to the chief and to uh, Rob Mora, and I think we should remove it. I think I agree. Anyone else? Jennifer. Uh, yeah, I agree too. So that makes sense. If we're not if we're not actively going to charge people, why would we have a schedule established in the first place? Okay, thank you. Uh, Let's see, anything under C, the public nuisance violations. We have a whole list of our um, mass general laws, zoning bylaws, general bylaws, any, any outstanding issues there. The nuisance property designation I need to make sure I can see everybody. Um, persons liable. Jointly and severally liable for penalties. 
first round is the um, the first and second violation. Number two is for a third violation or greater. We identify who's responsible. Enforcements and penalties. Um, Andy Johanneke made a comment relative to this, and her basic comment was uh, under number three, each day or portion there of a violation of this bylaw exists shall constitute a separate violation. If more than one provision of the bylaw is violated, each provision violated shall constitute a separate violation. And her comment was, this line is technically not necessary as general bylaw 2.2D says, each day on which any violation exists shall be deemed to be a separate offense. But unlike severability, which is the very last section in this document, the comment below, General Bylaw 2.2D doesn't specifically mention Article 3. So to be safe, I would leave this in. So she was feeling that it was perhaps um, unnecessary, but still made sense to keep in place. Does anyone, does anyone here have a comment about that? Jennifer has her hand up. Okay, I'm sorry, I can only see three people at a time. Oh. <clears throat> uh, mine was really just about the grammar. Is that each day a portion thereof of this spot? Should it be each day that a portion? Or each day or a portion thereof that a vile? I think the word that goes there someplace. Each day or portion thereof. thereof. That a violation of this bylaw exists shall constitute. That was my only comment. A separate, separate violation, yeah. And again, um, I think um, Councillor Ette. Each day or portion thereof that a violation of this bylaw exists shall constitute a separate violation. Is the violation ongoing or is it something that once it happens and it's noted as a violation, that ends it? Because the that gives the implication that um it is violations are ongoing and not just at an instant. So are you thinking that the wording that was there each day or portion the, thereof a violation exists? I'll admit I am not entirely clear about number three and perhaps writing it in a clearer way would be helpful. How that would be, I don't know. Okay, let's see again. Oh yeah, we already wrote, wrote this. This is Andy saying it makes sense to keep it in. Um, does anyone have a comment or concern about using the word that? I, it, it grammatically makes it a little more so. Each day. I don't know what's, I mean, to my ear, it sounded a little off, but I'm not trying to change the meaning. I think it's correct. Each day of the portion thereof, a violation of this bylaw exists. A single violation of this bylaw exists shall constitute a separate violation. So it, it makes sense without the word that. I think so. It's weird. It is weird. Well, we get one more KP law review, so. Yeah, each, let them do each it. Each day or a portion of a day, it, in a way we're saying, it, the, the thereof is each day or portion of a day, a violation of this law exists. I don't want to change thereof, but that's sort of what we're saying. Yeah. Councillor Ate. Councillor Ate. Um, 
So beyond the words, how would this, what does this mean in practice? What exactly does number three, how, how would it happen in real life? I'm going to turn to Mr. Mora and he could explain that. <laughs> I could explain it, but yeah. I think I would rather have him explain it. Yeah, and I, I, you know, the portion thereof is just, you know, we don't have to clock a whole 24 hour period for a violation to exist. So if the car is parked on the yard day one, it's a fine. If it goes into day two, but maybe not there for the full 24 hours, it's a second, it's a second violation. That's, that's really what it comes down to here is a portion of the day uh, that the violation exists does constitute a, a separate violation or additional violation. Thank you. So I think you used the word that a violation exists. So I think adding the word that makes sense. And, and um, if we're comfortable, we can move on. Um, the next is, section is the notification and, and correction process. And Mandy Jo had several comments about this. And mostly, uh, if I could summarize, it is that um, one, she, she wanted to avoid the use strictly of email and that the word contact, um, she was actually spelling it out. So I'll read it a couple places. Compliance with the section may be attained by email, certified mail, and or posting the notice on the property, giving the uh, enforcement authorities flexibility in how they um, notify people. And that she thought that not everyone has, um, you don't necessarily have all of the occupants email addresses. And I'm gonna read it here. Um, the town may not have email addresses for all occupants. So what she is suggesting is, um, and, I'm, and I'm looking at this one right here, Compliance with the section may be attained by email, certified mail, and or posting the notice on the property. Does anyone feel any discomfort with, with that correction? Um, how about the word occupants? She, I think she added the word occupants, although um, I'm sure we had occupants to begin with. So in, in this first case, the first and second violations within one year will be a notice will be delivered to all occupants, property owners, and persons in charge. So everybody gets notified. Oh, sorry, Jennifer, you have your hand up. No, I, I'm not trying to complicate things. It, <clears throat> excuse me. I remember KP law at one point questioned whether occupants pertained if it was multi-unit, you know, like a triplex or duplex. Was it just occupants of the unit? I mean, I don't, they didn't call it out here, so maybe it's fine. But certainly, certainly occupants would be one of the entities notified. Um, right. No, they had once had a question when you said, say occupants at a property, are you talking about just the, the unit in which the disturbance happens or? Yeah. Uh, and Mandy Jo also suggested that will result in liability of the owner and persons in charge for all penalties associated with the violation. So we had intended that the owner, they're notified. It's not saying that they're going to be penalized on the first or second offense violation, excuse me, but they are going to be notified. And I thought we all agreed to that. Uh, Chief Ting. I guess my question would be, relative to the owner and persons in charge. Um, so if the owner say lives out of state or out of town and they have a rental agency managing the uh, household, would it go to the management or would it go to the owner or both? Both. both. That's covering all bases. The owner will 
delegate whatever they want to delegate, I think, to the manager. Mm -hmm. But having that person in charge included along with the owner, I think, is what we were trying to achieve. Sounds good. Um, on the no, G2, the third violation or greater, let's just see what what Councillor Haneke says about that. The above to comments, they apply here too, and that's the, the same notice to occupants, owners, and persons in charge. Compliance with this section may be attained by email, certified mail, and or posting the notice on the property. So it's the same wording. It applies whether it's first and second or third uh, violation. Does anyone have a problem with that? Um, is G2C, uh, this was highlighted um, each day or portion thereof that a violation of this bylaw, we can add it here too, uh, exists beyond the corrective action plan time frame shall constitute a separate offense. If one or more provision of this bylaw is violated, each provision violated shall constitute a separate offense. And uh, she actually didn't have, I just highlighted that. Um, just so we would talk, stop and talk about it. Um, Councillor Haneke's uh, concern is actually on G2D, informing the owner of the requirement for the owner or designee to contact the enforcing authority within five days to schedule a meeting and submit a corrective action plan within 10 days. Her comment was, Grammatically, the 10 days applies to both the corrective action plan and the meeting. It therefore conflicts with section G3, A3 below. And I have made a note um, that I don't think there's actually a conflict here. And the reason I don't is that the notification process is that you're informing the owner to contact the enforcing authority within five days to schedule a meeting. And maybe we could say, comma, and, and, and to submit a corrective action plan within 10 days. And I think notifying them of those two items is the important thing. So they're really not, they're not in conflict with each other. Under three, we have within five days of the notice, the owners shall contact the authority. So now we're just spelling it out. We've already notified them, but now the correction process begins. 3A1, within five days, someone's going to contact the enforcing authority to schedule a meeting. Doesn't mean it has to happen. The meeting doesn't have to, have to happen within five days. But they need to reach out and and start to schedule within five days. Within ten days of that notice, the owner or someone shall submit a corrective action plan. Within fourteen days of the date of notice, the enforcing authority and the owner shall meet to review the corrective action plan. So that's two weeks after they've been notified. We better sit down and be ready to talk about it. Um, Mandy thought that this conflicts with uh, language in section G2D, which as written requires the meeting to be within 10 days. G2D, we changed a little bit and we said, um, informing the owner or designee to contact the enforcing authority within five days to schedule a meeting, comma, and to submit a corrective action plan within 10 days. Does anyone feel that that's um, unclear? So are, are we comfortable that we've not 
done something that's in conflict with another phrase. Um, her, her next change was that enforcing authority, we, we went through and we changed everything to enforcing authority at the suggestion of our, um, our staff. And that's just simply the use of that same wording instead of enforcement authority. State, not, state law not preempted. Any questions on that? And then the last action was, was item I, and Mandy Johanneke is suggesting that the, the section severability be deleted. I don't know. I'll read it to you. The, what it used to say was, the provisions of this bylaw shall be deemed severable so that the invalidity of any one provision of the bylaw shall not affect the validity of another provision. And if any part of this bylaw shall be adjudged unconstitutional, inconsistent with state law, or otherwise invalid, such judgment shall not affect any other valid part of this bylaw. And I'm looking to, I'm looking to Chief King and Rob Mora. Um, I can't remember if that is something that the town attorney put in. Yes, that's a state that was something the attorney added. It makes sense for us to replace that wording and and keep it in. I'm looking is I'm looking for some comment. I mean, I would think we should do with our attorney. Yes. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I, I missed the question, Pam. I, if if you were looking to me to answer something, I'm sorry. Let's read. Let's read Mandy Joe's um, sentence here. The general bylaws have a distinct severability clause, so each separate bylaw doesn't need its own. This should be deleted. KP law always adds it because they don't realize we have a distinct one that applies to all general bylaws. Um, see general okay, so, bylaws. Yeah, so the town attorney added this section, but you know we can just call attention to it during their review and let them decide if it can in fact come out. Good. Yeah, that makes sense. Good. So she's she's notifying them. We can leave this in here. We can leave that note in there, and we can ask for um, clarification from KP Law. That's a good a good response. Thank you. Okay. I just want to say that I'm here, but I'm going to be off camera for a bit. Okay. Thank you, Pat. I'm going to re I'm just going to open this up. Oh, Rob Mora. Up. Yeah, just one little thing. Um, I think a few versions ago, the word infraction was taken out everywhere. And it looks like it just, it still remains in 3-2. Thank you. If that's um, one last place to clean that up. It should say violation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I thought we got those, all those. Maybe I'll do one more, one last sweep of this as the clean it up. Does anyone want to make any comments? I think we're at a point if, if the wording is such and the um, police chief and building commissioner are comfortable with uh, the conversation and the modifications that were made tonight, recognizing that we will um, be sending this to GOL. I didn't think it had to go back to GOL, but I was told it should go back to GOL and it will get one last K 
KP law review at the request of the town manager. Would anyone like to um, make a motion as to how to proceed? And if I don't see your hand, Jennifer, I see your hand is up. So do we have to take a vote to approve sending it to GOL? So it's, um, and then GOL can send it, vote to t send it back to the council. I think that's the process. Yeah, okay. I don't think it would. I don't think it would come back. <clears throat> I don't think it would come back to CRC after okay. that. Well, no, I would I could be wrong. I could be wrong. So that sounds right. So we should have a motion to approve the amendments and send it. Recommend it that JO. Uh, GOL review this version. So I will move that. I don't have the bylaw in front of me. Here, let me as, do. As, as reviewed. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it's. Are we calling it? It's nuisance property 3.26. Yeah. yeah. So I move that general bylaw 3.26 be referred to GOL as amended by the Community Resources Committee. Second. Thank you. I'm writing this down so I don't forget. Um, do you want to add today's date? So amended by CRC on July, July 9th. 9th. Uh, Rob Moore has his hand up. Oh, thank you. I'm just curious. Are you all also recommending to the council? Yeah. Or is that, or, or did you say it's not going to come back to the CRC because it's a rec? I, I think it's a recommendation to the council that includes a, a, <clears throat> a you know, delivery to GOL. So You're right. Could, yeah. Yeah. So we recommend really that the council approve the amendments to general bylaw 3.26 upon the approval of GOL. Is that review? I would say review by review. GOL, not yes. review. Right. Review of GOL. Yeah. Thank you. So move. Um, CRC recommends that. The council adopt. Did I, I? I'm sorry. I'm I'm trying to write at the same yeah, time. Yeah, I, I adopt is probably well, that would be correct. Bylaw three point two six. Some say upon the recommendation of the community resources committee, or yeah, three point two six nuisance bylaw. Upon review by by uh, GOL. Yes. So I'm going to read it so we make sure we're all <laughs> agreeing to the same thing. Um, uh, move that um, the RC recommends that the council adopt the nuisance bylaw, nuisance property bylaw. 3.26 upon review of GOL and town attorney. Is there a second? Oh, I think Councilor Ette? Oh, I'm already did. I'm second already did. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And are you comfortable with those with those words as the seconder? Okay, then let's take a vote. This is now two and a half years in the making. We're we're getting very close. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, Bob uh, and Chief Ping. Um, let's see. Let's go around the room. Jennifer. Yes. Councillor Ette. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Excellent. Uh, Pam Rooney. Is an I, and there is um, one person absent. It is 
it is four yes and one absent. And we will move this baby along. Okay, thank you so much. It is 7.09. It's actually a little bit better than I was hoping for. So I see Stephanie here and we can segue into our next action item. Thank you everybody on that. Um, oh, the other thing is that I want to let you know, I will, um, I will clean it up. Thank you. Um, Thank I will you. clean Thank you. very, very much. Um, I will clean it up and I will leave in those couple of notes that we want the uh, town attorney to be paying uh, specific attention to. And I will put that in our packet and I will also send that document um, with the motion um, I'm actually looking at Jennifer or Pat. Does there need to be a re I have a report that I'm putting together for uh, for this. Um, I guess that needs to accompany this document. Although it seems a little premature because town council won't be actually voting on it or or even doing the first reading. Um, on the 15th. Right, until GOL comes out of GOL. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately. So the question is, do I need to do I need to submit the report yet? I don't think so. I don't think so. What okay. do you think? Councillor Ate, what do you think? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I don't think any of us really do. Yeah. I mean, the council can't act on it till GOL determines it's clear, concise, and actionable. Consistent and actionable. Yeah. Consist yeah. Right. It's That's not right. concise. It's not concise. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they will definitely send us back for that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so I will hold off on the report itself um, and we'll send it forward with blessings and have uh, the next round of review take place. Good. Hi, Stephanie. Good evening. How are you hey. all? Good. So I'm closing down, I'm closing down. Let's see, hold on. I need to save all those changes. Sorry. Stephanie, if you want to bring that um, document up on our screen, we've got solar. Sure. And I, I just wanted to note that I, I know Chris Brestrup actually did want to join us. I've just texted her to let her know that we're starting a little bit early. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay. I think I've saved that document. Are you seeing this? Yeah. Okay, good. Listen. No, not right now. Okay, so again, thank you for your patience. We were uh, just for a summary for those who are in the listening audience. Um, we'll just see if any more people have joined us. I can't actually see participants, so for some reason. Uh, we have two attendees, okay, Marty so, and Steve Roof. No one else okay. has joined at this time. Thank you, that helped. So we left off for those in the audience um, at section 17.10 and we are making our way through draft that was provided by the bi solar bylaw working group uh, as a document of um, many sections. It was suggested early in the process that some of the sections might be better off as rules or regulations as opposed to actual bylaw and we have been making our way through the document to um, ascertain if we, if we 
agree with that, or if we're if we are essentially adopting um, as as they were proposed by the working group, and we, we ended up uh, thanks to Stephanie with uh, section 17.10 stormwater management and erosion and sedimentation control. I think I might preface this part of the conversation is is from what limited knowledge I have of solar projects, it is seems to be one of the largest issues confronting them and making making solar uh, a scary thing in a, in, a, in a way is because of the um, erosion and erosion management that often goes awry. So we've seen projects that that have had this happen, and I think the working group was very, uh, very focused on making sure that um, direction was given to the appropriate planning and design of a project. Um, I'll stop at that. Of this section, section 10 stormwater management, um, are people, what, how do people feel about this being a, a bylaw, a rule or reg, or a um, general condition? Stephanie has her hand raised. Definitely, thank you. I couldn't see it. Here it is. Yep. That's okay. Sorry, Lynn's in my background. I'm sorry. Um, so I had uh, written a memo to the CRC dated May 10th, uh, 2024, regarding review of this section with recommendations. And I, I don't believe that's in this current packet, but it was in a previous packet. And I don't know if it would help if I actually read the memo with the recommendations that would be yeah why not okay so it's on my phone so I apologize i'm just for a, for a summary of it i and i do okay. remember reading it and i don't remember your specific recommendation sure yeah. why don't i just give you the summary um so basically there were four questions that the crc members particularly councillor henneke were interested in answering um, one of them is what is the list of submittal requirements for a project, what would be, or who would be responsible for review of the submission, its implementation and enforcement? The third question, what would be uh, the submittable, um, sorry, what would the submittal requirements be? And then the fourth question, is this section redundant to the town's existing stormwater management bylaw? So my responses to each of those particular inquiries was number one, the list of documentation at the beginning of section 1710 was only meant to serve as resource information, but should not be included in the actual solar bylaw. Our local bylaw and soon to be accompanying regulations incorporate and mandate adherence to federal and state law. So essentially the references, uh, the sources that are cited at the beginning of this section it's really confusing to send someone to each of those sources because you're basically directing them to existing state law, existing federal law, the local bylaw. It, it's just, it will get somebody in a circular pattern that won't really get them anywhere. So it's really, I think the wetlands administrator had only provided them as reference documents. Um, and for number two, the stormwater management bylaw clearly defines the town manager and the DPW as the responsible parties, quote, for the administration, implementation, and enforcement of the solar management bylaw, stormwater management bylaw. And then also the stormwater management bylaw refers to the state's stormwater handbook, note, as does the town's wetlands protection bylaw as well. The Amherst General Bylaw Section 3.57E Administration, um, parenthetical three, and I, this is from directly from the town's general bylaw section. 
the Department of Public Works will utilize the policy criteria and information, including specifications and standards of the latest edition, emphasis added, of the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, Mass DEP Stormwater Handbook, and any amendments thereto, emphasis added, for execution of the provisions of this bylaw. The handbook includes a list of acceptable stormwater treatment practices, including the specific design criteria for each stormwater practice. And then in response to inquiry number four, the stormwater management bylaw applies to land disturbance of one acre or more, which is the same application as the solar bylaw. Therefore, a solar development that must adhere to the solar bylaw must adhere to the existing stormwater management bylaw. And I concluded in light of the above, I recommend the solar bylaw section 17.10 stormwater management and erosion con and sedimentation control require adherence to the general bylaws of the town of Amherst, Massachusetts section 3.57 stormwater management bylaw. And that will direct them to everything else that you've mentioned essentially. Correct, yes. That would certainly make life simpler. <laughs> yeah. Stephanie, you still have your hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. So let's let's make a note of that. Um, if you could kindly sure. Oh, Jennifer, you've got your hand up. No, not about that. I was just wondering, are we're gonna go through each of the questions that Councillor Haneke had that's referred to in the memo? Well, Stephanie just addressed some of those. Right. I'm sorry. Did I miss the one about which submittal documents are required? Or is that in a different, that will be in a different section of the bylaw? It, it was all, it was, that would be a different, I think that section. would be a different okay. section. And also... Yeah. There are requirements that are part of the stormwater management bylaw. So oh, okay. anyone adhering to that, there's going to be requirements for submission as part of adhering to that bylaw section. Okay, thank you. Just a, a quick uh, request of the chair is, it would have been helpful and I should have looked back myself because you know, I'm also responsible for preparing for this meeting. But it would have been good if Stephanie's memo were in this packet since we were yep. currently going to be using it, looking at it. Yep. I I completely forgot that to bring it forward. Yeah, no shame though, Blaine. Let's just change it from here. Yeah. Yep. Yes, thank you. Um, while we're on that topic, the um as much for us as for anyone who's looking um, at the solar bylaw, there's, um, I started out with a, a file called resources and it's got <laughs> a dozen different um, documents that uh, were provided us. Does that make sense to keep pulling forward each time? I know, um, I think when Athena hosts the meeting, it, it gets listed and I, I just want to make sure that it just doesn't overwhelm the packet material for somebody trying to follow this process. I don't hear any answers. Okay. Okay, let's let's move along. Uh, but can we can we make sure that we um that we make note, Stephanie, of your of your commentary that we need to uh, direct to, um, that adherence to the town's bylaw 3.57 the appropriate action. Yes. Let me just get the right citation.
Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. So that section remains in the bylaw in a, in a greatly reduced format. And we can move to, so this, this section right here, uh, if you stop right there before we get to section 1711, uh, there are a number of recommendations of um, structures and vertical clearances and vegetation cover. Um, those feel like they're design design standards. It should still be in the it should still be in the bylaw. To, seems to me anyway. Um, but it feels like these are better served in um, the design standards section. You want to just make a quick note of that. Pam, yeah. could you say that again? I'm sorry. Sure. Um, this, this, this vegetative cover shall have 90% or better coverage. Meadow condition is preferable. Mown areas, mowed to a height of four inches. Or no shorter than, I mean, all of these seem like design guidelines. And I'm, I'm just thinking out loud that they might be more appropriate in the design essentially the design standards section of the bylaw rather than in stormwater management. Um, well, except it talks about runoff. I, I, I'm not sure. I, and it seems it's, it's, a, it's uh, dealing with stormwater runoff. And this is... Boom, boom, boom. So let's. Um, so the question that comes to my mind is if if we go with a uh, a more succinct statement of follow best stormwater management practices, I don't want these items to be lost. Question: The question might be where do they show up in the document if if they're not? Um, I, I think you're absolutely right, Pat. They they support best management practices so that we don't get the we don't get the erosion issues that others have faced. So can we make a note and just say, you know, are these are these best here or are they best in another part of the document? Um Councillor yeah, actually had his hand raised. Correct. Okay. So, and then Council uh, Jennifer Taub does. I don't know why I can't see everybody. Thank if you, you don't mind, I don't mind letting you know when hands are up. So. Just yell at me. Councillor Ette. I'm wondering where these uh, recommendations came from, because if we do know, then we could point to that source rather than have this list as it is. Okay, good point. Chris, Christine Bestorp has her hand up. Thank you. Chris. Yeah, I think most, if not all of these recommendations might have come from this um, Water Supply Protection Committee, um, even though the next section down, protection of drinking water supplies is more in their wheelhouse, but I think they also wanted to make these suggestions. So I can look to um, confirm that, but I believe that these came from the Water Supply Protection Committee. Thank you. And again, the question might be, um, uh, is this a good spot to put it? I mean, they're, and they're, they're very similar. Um, the question is, is this the best spot for it or, or should we have this material
let's see. Does anyone else have their hand up, Jennifer? Yeah. Well, I'm just sort of curious. So are these, they, they do read like design standards, but are they actually the wetland protections? And it, I mean, is are they here for the sake of wetland protections or design standards or both? And and do they have more teeth in one place versus the other? Good. That's the question. <laughs> um has their hand raised. Um, I think that they're related to erosion and erosion control. So, you know, it probably does make sense to put them in the design section. Um, and the Water Supply Protection Committee would be concerned about erosion because they don't want to, um, you know, make the waters that would eventually be used for drinking uh, be contaminated by um, soil and erosion and siltation. So I would go along with these being put in the uh, design standards section. Thank you. Uh, does someone else besides Chris have a hand up? Oh, sorry. No, I've, I'm just no. looking at the note. Section 1711, protection of drinking water supply. And as Christine just mentioned, we have some similar um, lists of important factors that um, the Water Supply Committee was interested in. Stephanie, did you want to say anything of uh, protection of drinking water supplies relative to your comment on um, stormwater management? Uh, no, I, I didn't you specifically review the section. Um, I think we were deferring to the- Can anyone um, hear her? Oh, can, can you not hear me, Pam? I can hear. I can hear. Can somebody, can you hear me? Nod your head if you, Pat, can you hear me? I yes, can hear. Can. I can't yeah. hear anybody else. Huh. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna sign out and come back in. And Jennifer, can you just keep? keep yeah, the we'll keep talking. Going, please. Yes. Sorry. Just okay. Was Stephanie? You were speaking. I was. I was just responding to um, Pam's uh, inquiry as to whether I had. Uh, reviewed this section. And I think in this case, we were deferring to the Water Supply Protection Committee's recommendations. So this came from them, and I didn't specifically review it. But the Solar Bylaw Working Group was comfortable with this? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I just have a question. When this goes, this is going to go back to different town departments for, and I guess, committees for review, would it go back to the water supply or? I, I believe it will. Okay. But I can't tell if Pam's back. Are there any other counselors have questions about this section? Okay, should we? We'll let Pam come back or we can move on. Can you hear us? I don't think she can hear or be heard. So did, were there any other questions that, um, or comments staff want to make or questions that CRC members have about uh, um, section 17.11. Yeah, there were uh, some issues that were brought up by, um, I'm not sure who the person's first name is, Mr. and Ms. Labby, Labby, 
about uh, setbacks and stuff around wells and things like that? Should we be... So I'm, I can't quite see the screen, the uh, language here. Is it uh, not large enough or? Yeah, it's not quite yeah, it's large not. enough. Okay, yeah. I can make it bigger. Thank you. Is that better? Yes. Yeah, and, yes. And I, I believe the issue, I'd have to go back and look, but I believe the issue was that there needed to be a, a larger buffer zone near private wells and then um then the hundred but i'm i'm having trouble making things small enough for us so that i could see that letter and i apologize i was going to print it out and as you know i fell asleep um, <laughs> i'm looking at it but uh, yeah it basically I don't want to approve this section or anything like that until we have a chance to really look at that letter and look at the concern. Um, well, I don't, I, I mean, at this point, I think you're still just putting a, a final draft together of the document. So this will go to the Water Supply Protection Committee and other um, right. staff yeah. For review. So there'll be opportunity for their comments to weigh in as well. Right. Um, yeah, that's true. It might be helpful, though, to have a note here that we need to really look at setbacks in relationship to private wells. Sure. I'm just going to make that a make to the whole section. Yeah, also, because the areas where they probably have large scale ground mounted installations would be a lot of properties with private wells or more than other parts of town. Yeah. Okay. And Pat, do you recall that comment coming as a letter or a public it comment? It came in as an email. It was part of a district two meeting that I was not able to attend. So okay. I but remember it came in. That. Um, yeah, but it is in our packet. Yeah. Okay. So I made note. I, I do want to say that a member of the public has their hand up, but we're not having public comment right now. So I think that I don't know what you want to do, Chair, as Chair Pam. I'm, that's interesting. I'm not seeing that in the in the attendees. Yep. Wow. Well, it's down now. Arlie had oh, it. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm saying I just switched to it. I didn't see it. Yeah. I'm... Okay. Is Pam back? Can she hear us? No, I guess not. Um, okay. <clears throat> so I don't. So do we have? Do we want to move Chris on? Chris has to her the, hand yeah, up. Chris, I, yeah. I do. I can see the hands actually. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Chris. So I wanted to suggest somebody could email Pam or text her and suggest that she join the meeting on her phone. On her phone. And yeah. That she could speak. And she would be able to see what we're looking at, but she'd be able to speak in perhaps here. Thank you, Chris. Yep. Yeah, I'll do. I actually just got a text from her. Um, so I will ask her. Okay. Yeah, she said she can't leave the meeting because she's the host and it will end, but I asked if she could call in. Uh, Councillor Ette? She could always uh, make a new co-host and um, try and see if she could either make the call or restart her system. I think the right. option. Um, she's going to try and call in. I'm wondering, can she make me the co-host? Would Athena have to do that? She could make you the co-host. She could make you, yeah. Okay, I'm just texting. I'm sorry. Let 
That's so odd that you just lose sound. Okay, so I asked if she could make me the co-host and then she can re-sign in. I don't know, will, um, will I be alerted when I am the co-host? So this, I just want to, again, just ask for clarification. The, um, the Safe Water Drinking Committee reviewed this or worked with the Solar Bylaw Working Group on this section and it has not changed since then. So when it goes back to them, they'll be reviewing, would they make, they'll be reviewing what they've already reviewed or what they initially wrote? Uh, Chris. So the um, Water Supply Protection Committee did not review this as a whole. Okay. What they did was they wrote what they called a white paper, which commented and made recommendations on the intersection between solar installations and water supply. So they went through a very long explanation about how the two might interact, and then they made recommendations. And Jack Jemsick was a member of the Solar Bylaw Working Group, and he was also a member of the Water Supply Protection Committee. And he did review this whole um, solar bylaw here, but I wouldn't say that... Um, the Water Supply Protection Committee reviewed the bylaw. Okay. And, you know, didn't didn't as a whole make recommendations to us. So I just wanted to make that distinction. Yeah, okay. I appreciate that. Because this is where I struggle with this whole bylaw. Like when I read this, I don't have enough expertise to know what's missing or if it's comprehensive. So that's what... So... Do we know that by sending it back to the Water Supply Protection Commission or town staff? Or maybe there's, you know, I mean, Pat, you you are much more, seem much better steeped in this than I am. Or it may just be me, and I don't want to impose my lack of expertise on the other CRC members, but that's what I struggle with. I don't really have right. No, but I struggle, too, with a very similar thing. There was a lot <laughs> to know. And I think that there are, that one of the things, the best things that can happen is that we share this not only with the Water Protection Committee and Conservation Committee, and but that we also bring it forward um, um, to as many people as we can. Um, you know, I want to, I want to explore who this person is who wrote this letter. What's their expertise? and whether or not we can have people uh, in the community also look at this. Um, it's, it's the question of wells is a very big one because particularly where, as you said, I believe it was you who said it, that this is, these are going in in places. Um, and positioning something um, is, is just really important. So I don't know all of the details here, but I don't want to, lose that, you know, maybe you and I need to sit down and start looking at this in a different way and talking to a variety of people, not just the people who are for it or the people who are against. Right. So can I'd that like to happen speak in to oh. Jack Jemsick myself, right. which I'm going to probably do. Oh, Pam has her hand up. Can you? I can hear you. you we can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I have no idea what happened. Sorry about that. I am handing the baton happily back to you. <laughs> Thank you. And I and I, I caught Pat's comment that these are important items. Don't need to, do not want to lose them, and that um, uh, that you want to hear from a number of people um, on on the topic. So, so is the is the commentary that um, setbacks for private wells? That's just a that's just a reminder for us to be 
uh, extremely aware of, of what we specify for um, private wells. Jennifer, you have your hand up. So in terms of getting as much information as we can from the community, we can do that on our own, but is there also a way, is it just a, a, a listening session or public hearing, or can we invite people to the committee to speak with us? Like how can we, in a more formal structured way, go about getting more of that information and input? That's, for me, that's a tricky question because I feel like, well, there's the for, you know, and against, and what I'm looking for is people who are um, in neither place who see the importance of large ground mounted solar installations, and I do, but also are very aware of um, water supply and well and wells in Amherst. It's it's not, you know, it we are very good at hopefully protecting the public water supply, but we really also need to protect private water supply because this private, you know, I hate using this as an example, but I'm going through the Shootsbury Road project. All of the houses along Shootsbury Road are on wells, but so are the people on Flathills, et cetera. And so it becomes really important that we understand and the bylaw reflects a way to protect the health and safety of residents around their water supply. So I, I'm not saying I have expertise or anything else, but I'm saying I don't want us to just say, oh, well, Jack looked at this and it's been here. Um, you know, my goal will be over the next week or so to really pay attention to this specific issue so I can come back and be more articulate about what I think and, and why I think it. I would I would build on what Pat says and that that in that folder of resources that we talked about, there is an, a vast amount of information and some of this um, feeds directly on examples from other communities and from other uh, other templates um, that um, should give us some good guidance. Are we ready to move to section 1712? So the, the change here, I think, was that construction monitoring was used to be separate from maintenance and it's been joined into one item. So that becomes 17.12 and we lose 13 or everything else just shifts down accordingly. Um, any thoughts on, on this being um, bylaw specific or, or the opportunity for setting conditions that um, an enforcement agency might um, manage? I think these things should be in the bylaw um, as opposed to a separate regulation. You know, separate regulations. Yeah. Because we're really talking about reporting and, and having a way to reflect on what's going on while the process is happening. How about section uh, 713 then, or 714? I think it's it's 17 in, in many of our original documents, but this is the reporting section. Um, someone made a great suggestion that uh, some of this material be condensed into a table. And, you know, this is, this is um, probably a great example of of where that would be appropriate. Um, here are the here are the various reports that are required over the course of a project. It would be um, much simpler than trying to figure out if it, if you're on paragraph three or paragraph five two years into your project. Hmm. 
Makes sense. And we might just following on that, it, it might be that we could uh, make a statement that um, reporting, uh, a list of reporting um, is is provided or, you know, we, we address reporting in the bylaw, but we, re we refer them to something and we, like we, re we refer them to um, the list of conditions or the reporting requirements. Was that accurately stated, Pam? I can squint and see a few seconds ago, condense uh, section into a table statement that that list of reporting requirements is included and refers folks to the la to the table. Yeah, yeah, that cap that captures it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anything else from that section? Seventeen, wait, one five or one four, Susan. You know, appropriate to to notify them that if modifications are made, there'll be there'll be additional requirements. Can, can you hear me still? My sound just cut out again. I we can't can hear. hear it. We can oh, hear can you. Hear. Good. Oh, I can hear. I can hear. Good. <laughs> Sorry. Any other comments on section 17, 14? How about 17, 15? Transfer of ownership. Pretty important to know that we will track the the ownership as it goes. A number of these companies have changed hands that I'm aware of. Seventeen sixteen. <laughs> So, so far we're just sort of agreeing that these are bylaw chunks. These are not rules or regs or, or anything else that they belong here. Um, 1717. Financial surety um, is something that a number of communities uh, recognized as being an issue that if something goes wrong, um, I think a number of companies or several that I'm aware of, um, several companies have sold off to a subsidiary or a secondary um, mm -hmm. entity. And then those people have declared bankruptcy and were, were not uh, held uh, accountable for either modifications or complete closure of a project as required. So somewhere in this financial surety, um, I hope we cover that. Well, it's interesting whether or not, and I apologize again for not, whether or not we ask for, the, for an escrow account uh, to be established, because that, that's a way of avoiding this transfer to another company that goes bankrupt, you know, which is kind of a planned action by a series of uh, developers or can be, and whether or not there needs to be information here about a, an escrow account, it would be interesting to, and I think finance committee would look at this also, but I think that it would be interesting to have some of their input. 
It does list an escrow account. It Pardon does, me? It does list an escrow account. Okay. Oh, good. You want to just highlight that with yellow or something like yeah, that? Yeah, so that I can get back. Councillor Ette. And this is just a question for and perhaps an explanation of this section. What is the purpose? I'm new to issues related to solar, but what would be the purpose of financial certain? Well, for me, for me, I'm really concerned about where cost of decommissioning this will fall. And I don't want it to fall on the town. It should fall on the developers, well, all of them. Uh, and this, the escrow account, uh, to cover the cost of construction and installation and removal and stabilization of the site in the event the town must remove the cover the uh, remove the installation and remediate the landscape in an amount and form determined to be reasonable by the uh, PGA, but in no event to exceed more than 120. See, I, I have, maybe this is, Chris, you can say, maybe this is a legal thing. What if it costs more than 125% of the cost of removal? You know, what we don't know a lot about what damage could happen and how do we protect ourselves as a town financially? Christine? Well, I think there are a number of different things that are going on here. One is we wanna be able to complete a project if a proponent who's build most, built most of it or part of it goes bankrupt and goes away. So completing an installation, I think that's important. And then at the other end, if somebody um, decide, determines that the installation is no longer um, operating as he had hoped and he isn't making as much money and he just abandons it, we need money to um, remove what's there and stabilize the site. Um, but we usually have an escalation clause in here. Um, in fact, it's, this, it's the last sentence of the second paragraph the amount shall include a mechanism for escalating removal costs as costs may affect may be affected by inflation. So this is something that the uh, building commissioner is very familiar with and often requires something um, for the things that are approved by the planning board or the zoning board of appeals, or sometimes he requires uh, such a thing for issuing a building permit. So I think that the town, you know, as a whole, well, at least the building commissioner and and the planning department are familiar with this aspect and can come up with a mechanism for um, making it work. And usually the Zoning Board of Appeals writes something into their decision, a condition that has to do with this, um, that usually often they require a bond and they require that the bond be kept up from year to year, but it could be also in the form of an escrow account. So these things are kind of worked out through the approval process and we end up with something that makes sense for the particular applicant and the particular installation with the advice of the building commission. Does that help? Thank you very much. Yeah, that's helpful to me. I know that. And so it's so part, what was going through my head as you said that, Christine, is that we might flag something like that as a as a part of a potential um, ZBA or permitting authority condition that it might be just something to remind them of. I wouldn't take it out of this bylaw, but I think it is also a good idea to remind. The CBA and the planning board, if they become the permit granting authority, that they should consider this as a mechanism for making sure that um, things are taken care of in the future. 
Thank you. Yes. Jennifer. You know, it's kind of a general question because it's this is a yeah. new industry, so to speak. I mean, so is, is that a factor also that some of these companies maybe are new, haven't been around that long, so you don't, you're not maybe as confident in their long-term viability, you know, that. Yep, that's right. Uh, let's move to severability. Uh, oops, sorry. Payment or taxes in payment in lieu of taxes. Can we go back for a minute? Sure. And look at what Stephanie just wrote. Um, and I think that could be misinterpreted in the future. So we're saying we recommend this as a condition to the permit granting authority, but I think we should also say that we recommend that this section be included in the bylaw. So it's going to be included in the bylaw, and then it will also be a condition. Absolutely. Thank okay. you. Yep, thank you. Good catch. Um, perhaps Christine can can describe what's trying to happen with taxes or payment in lieu of taxes. Do we get pilot payments for any solar projects? Um, I don't know. I don't know how this has transpired in Amherst. I know there's a solar project on the Hampshire College campus, and I don't know. Uh, that's obviously a nonprofit, um, which doesn't pay taxes. So perhaps there's an agreement for a pilot uh, payment from Hampshire, although I don't know that for a fact. By the way, Steve Roof is in the audience, so he may be able to answer that question. And perhaps Stephanie has had experience with that in some of the um, installations that she's worked on. Let's go to, let's go to, I, I, there was someone else in the audience that had the hand up for a bit. And I'm, I, we're almost at the end, and then I would like very much to hear from the folks in the audience. Um, Stephanie, do you have any comments about that particular? Yeah, you have your hand up. Thank you. Yes, I was just going to say that we did have a pilot uh, agreement, pilot payment agreement for the Southern Landfill Project, and I believe there was also one for Hickory Ridge. And, um, and they are different in that we were, so we were leasing the land for the solar landfill project, but at Hickory Ridge, the developer actually owned the parcel, but there was still a pilot payment made because it was refer it was um, in reference to the the taxes. So mm -hmm. it is it's standard, I believe, for a pilot payment. Thank you. Um, that raises the question: if uh, if I want to make sure that we address the opportunity for um, our institutions of higher ed. So you, you mentioned Hampshire. Um, if I think of the, the land, the bodies of land in Amherst that are undeveloped, um, those certainly those institutions come to mind. Um, did, did anyone in town have any say in the permitting of the Hampshire solar project? Hampshire College Solar Project. The planning board was the permit granting authority on that on that project. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. And I don't remember if there was any discussion of pilot during that process, or if that came up later as part of a building permit application. Mm -hmm. But that might be something to look into. And Christine, can you remind us why it was the the planning the planning board instead of the ZBA that handled Hampshire? Because it was considered an accessory use to the educational use of the campus. So um, unlike um, installations that would be, you know, standalone projects on a piece of land that aren't associated with an institution, those would go before the Zoning Board of Appeals. But in the case of Hampshire College, pretty much anything that Hampshire College does would go to the planning board if it is required to get a land use permit. So the building commissioner made the call that it would be um, the planning board that would review that as an accessory use. Thank you. That's good to know. 
Uh, how about section 1719 severability? We just had uh, we just had this conversation at our last bylaw conversation, and it was that in fact the town has this clause in uh, general bylaws already. Uh, the town attorney had asked that that clause be added to the nuisance bylaw. I suspect there was the same discussion. Uh, this round, if we could make a note that severability may be covered under the town's general bylaw already, and do we need it here as well? May I interject to say yeah. that the general bylaw is separate from the zoning bylaw, that they're two distinct separate things. So if something is in the general bylaw, it wouldn't necessarily be applicable to the zoning by law. So it does it does make sense in the nuisance bylaw, which is a general bylaw, it's covered by the general bylaw severability clause. This is a zoning bylaw, so it would not be covered by the general bylaw. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. All the nuances. And 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 last but not least, 17.20 appeals. That certainly feels like it ought to be in the bylaw. And I'm looking at Christine Brestrup again. Um, if it this this statement is in the bylaw, but it may also end up um under rules and regulations perhaps um if we wanted to spell out how appeals were made and i hope we don't get into that but <laughs> um that would be a, a location for that kind of information as well it could be in both places yes okay So I'm going to pause our conversation for a minute and I'm gonna go see if there are folks in the audience who would like to raise their hands and speak up. Oh, excuse, uh, Councillor Ette, why don't you go ahead? It's just a, a question from the appeals section. So the first paragraph speaks of um, an appeal to the zoning board regarding a planning board decision or an appeal to the superior court regarding a zoning board decision. But the fourth paragraph speaks of an appeal to a decision of the building commissioner. And I'm just wondering if someone is aggrieved that the decision of the building commissioner, where would the appeal go to? That would go to the zoning board of appeals. So fact, there's um, a section um, on this application to the zoning board okay. um, specifically about that, but perhaps you're raising a question about whether somehow we should combine the first paragraph and the fourth paragraph to make it more, make it sense, make, make better sense. Um, because really it's the same idea that people who work for the town when they have the ability to make a decision and somebody is not pleased with the decision, often those appeals go to the Zoning Board of Appeals. For instance, we had a, an appeal to the Zoning Board um, that was in response to a decision that was made by the Historical Commission. So there, there's more than just the Planning Board and the Building Commissioner whose decisions can be appealed to the Zoning Board. So maybe we need to figure out how to word this in a more mm, complete way so that it's clear that the building commissioner, the planning board, and anybody else who's related to this particular topic of solar bylaws, if they made a decision, um, their decisions would be appealed to the Zoning Board of Appeals. That would only be true in the case of um, a town body. Thank you.
Well, uh, um, Stephanie is, uh, it looks like she just finished that. And let's go to the audience and see if there are, in fact, some folks. Uh, Arlie, you have your hand up. You've had it up for a very long time. I appreciate your patience. Um, if you would like to speak to this topic, uh, we would appreciate it. You have up to three minutes. And uh, I guess I have to allow you to talk. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Um, hi. No, this has been um, interesting. I didn't have my hand up the whole time. I took it down and then I put it up again when you said we, we could say something. I just want to go back to that first part where you were wondering about that language about the wetlands and where it belonged. I just, when I was looking at the document, it seemed to me it said something about like the, the, um, wetlands bylaw and that all that list underneath was about the wetlands bylaw. That's the way I was looking at it. So I know nothing about this. It's just, it sort of struck me that that information was there as a description or something of what the wetlands bylaw was. So that was that. And my other, I just had a question of, um, so the stormwater bylaw of the town is, I guess, I don't know a lot about this, but is that also dealing with the erosion and sedimentation? No, it's also. Okay. I'm, thank you. Um, and I'm happy to have Stephanie respond to that or, or, sure. or Christine. I can respond to the, um, the list of the wetlands. It, it wasn't a list of wetlands resources. I mean, well, it is. But it's it's referring to actual regulations, um, and there were state regulations listed, there were federal regulations listed, and there was the town local bylaw. And if you actually clicked on any of those links, it just takes you to um, all of the regulatory framework, which is telling people how they should submit their materials for applications for projects. But the problem is that. Um, it's, it's redundant because our wetlands bylaw requires adherence to those other regulatory frameworks. So it, it really becomes very circular and very confusing for any applicant who is filing to have to click onto those resources and follows the, the guidance in each of those documents. Um, it would just be very, very confusing. So we're just saying that you have to basically comply with the existing regulations as they are. So um, it's actually making it simpler and cle clearer for people if they're filing. I, I hope that made sense. Um, and I'm sorry, I forgot the second part of your question. Oh, um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hi. Um, I guess well, I was talking about, I guess I was that part all about the vegetation and the setbacks for the, the wells and stuff. I, and so, I, somebody was saying, does this belong under design or where is it? But anyway, um, right. I, I just wanted to ask also, I went to this Western Mass uh, Solar Forum and this guy, Michael Judge, who's the Undersecretary of Energy, he laid out this whole smart solar that's going to be rolling out from the state. I don't, are, are you all, um, I don't know, aware of this and following this? Yes. Yes. Because <laughs> it sounds like they want to just make it this simplified thing that this, I don't know, this sounds a lot more nuanced and complex than what they're envisioning is all I can say. <laughs> Uh, Christine, you have your hand up if you want to respond, please. Yeah, I'll just say a few things. I don't really understand the whole proposal, but it's a legislative proposal that um, still needs to be voted on by the legislature in Boston. And I don't know if it will actually come to pass during this term, but um, there are kind of two tiers to it. Um, very large 
solar installations will be completely under the control of the state and the state will grant permits for them. And I think it's larger than 25 megawatts, if I'm not mistaken. And I don't remember what the other criteria was, but essentially the state is trying to make these things, uh, make the process go more quickly um, because they are feeling pressure to have more solar installations so that we can address the climate change issue and um, you know mm -hmm. provide our energy in a, in a different way from the way we're providing it now. So, so they're grabbing onto those really big um, installations. Anything less than 25 megawatts will still go through a local process but the local process is proposed to be capped. I think it's 12 months. Um, and that's kind of a short amount of time. I mean, I'm involved in the review of a, of a local proposal now, and it's gone on for, um, well, it's, it's closing in on a year for the current application. And there was a prior application that was a couple of years ago for the same installation. So, you know, I, I would have been very disappointed if we were capped at a year to review this thing. Um, so I think there are aspects of that legislation that may be good, you know, to take something that's really huge and not have a small town have to deal with it. Um, on the other hand, something that's not that big, um, and for instance, the Shootsbury Road project, um, it, I think it's around 10 megawatts. Maybe Pat DeAngelis knows. I don't more. remember right now. Yeah. But, you know, so if you're talking about 25 megawatts, that's enormous. So the Shootsbury Road project would still be under the control of the town. We would just be limited in the amount of time that we could spend reviewing it. Um, so anyway, that's kind of what I know. I'm not sure that it's... Um, the legislation is ready to be voted on. I kind of doubt it. It seems like it has some things that still need to be worked out, and I'm hoping that that's the case. But the reason that the state is doing this is that they feel pressure to have a, a quicker process that than has been the case recently. Thank you. And consequences be damned. <laughs> Jennifer. So could a um municipality so actually, hold on hold on just it just occurs to me we're, we're having this conversation with arlie we should probably thank arlie for her comment <laughs> and then go back to having her arlie arlie thank you for your comment <laughs> <laughs> so my question is could a mu local municipality determine that they that twenty five thousand megawatts is too large or do they have no say in what happens once it gets to that level? They have. They would have input. They would. Um, the state would reach down to the town, and you know, ask for input from the government, the town government, and from the citizens. But the state, oh, would have the ultimate. I think that's written into whatever is being proposed, but. Um, the state would have the ultimate control over granting the permit for such an installation. But could the municipality say, no, we don't want, it's too large? I don't think so in that yeah, case. So it's not really very helpful. In that. <laughs> I digress. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So we, we oh, Pat, you have your hand up. Yeah, I, I'm not a, a question on the, this. It's a question for Stephanie and Christine. Um, we did an incredible job with the installation on the landfill near the dump. Um, wonderful project. There's also the landfill where the dog park is and people tried to put solar there years ago and it got stopped because of the grasshopper sparrow. Um, if it is true what the proponents of large scale are saying that and farmers can graze sheep and all of that under panels and around panels, would there really be a devastation of the grasshopper sparrow if we use that site 
because basically this was a, a butters who didn't like the idea. And so they, you know, and I'm, it, it just seems to me that this is a, a perfect site for solar installation. And, but I, I wouldn't, would the bird life be able to stay there? It seems like it would, but I don't, I don't know. So I'm just really kind of curious. Patty, you asked, I'm sorry. I, just to clarify Pat's question, because I'm assuming you would want me to answer this. Um, yes, I do. <laughs> um, are you asking if the the grasshopper sparrow would be able to utilize that area as habitat if there were a solar installation? Yes, that's the. It? Thank you for simplifying the question. <laughs> sure, um, and I believe the answer would be no. They would be very unlikely to remain there because my understanding is that they tend to be in habitat where there's grasses and there's more of a okay yeah so dead, that... if you will so um they'd be less inclined to be there and that was why we were able to develop that site was because uh, the, the, yeah, new, the other one. new landfill was so that the old landfill would be put in in permanent protection as habitat which remains open Gotcha. Um, so there, at this point, there can't be an installation on that now because we have a conservation restriction on that parcel. Okay, thank you. That, that's a real curiosity. Um, yeah. I'm going to try to find, I'm kidding right now, uh, a, a conservation restriction on Shutesbury Road so we can protect people, um, some people's okay. wells. But <laughs> I, I think we need to, we need to um, circle back uh, and finish up our meeting here. We have we have made our basic walk through this document, so we at least have determined what what this committee feels is um, bylaw versus anything else. Um, we have another couple of steps. I I I would like very much to talk about the next steps, um, and just but keep an eye on the time that we're ten minutes from the end of the meeting. Um, while we are on this general topic of comments, I would like to point out that in my uh, in the packet, I put in an email that I received from an attendee at the at the district two meeting. She had a very good question, and so I didn't know what else to do with it. I put it in our packet. Um, Councillor Haneke wrote to me separately, and she said, um, "This is a slippery slope. Are we going to be putting in every single comment?" that we get from people. And I said, well, it was directed to me di separately and not to the CRC or to a town council. And and so I think what, uh, what she suggested is perhaps if any of us gets a uh, a comment or on this topic or any, any CRC topic that you feel you want to share, but you, you aren't endorsing or otherwise, um, whatever, if it's coming to you specifically, if you want to forward it to the rest of the committee to just hit forward and, and just say, I received this, I'm sending it to the rest of the committee. Is, is that an acceptable way to But there it? should be no response so we don't discuss it? Right. It's, it's just that I'm passing this along, I received it. Yeah. FY, yeah. FYI or something. Councillor Ete. If I get you correctly, your point is that when we we can receive comments from the public and we could send it along to the entire group, but it wouldn't be something that would end up in the packet. Not necessarily. That's that's the point I think is that she felt I mean, we could have, I said, well, maybe we have a folder in our packet. It's every comment we've, we've received on this topic. Um, and she said, well, so many of the of the comments are addressed to everyone, the, the larger bodies. Um, the, you know, you already received those comments. Um, these, these were when it was directed specifically to one of us and we just want to get it off our plate to to hit it forward to um to the rest of the committee. 
Christine. Okay, so I remember having a conversation with Lauren Goldberg of KP Law about this kind of situation. And her her feeling was that or her, her advice to us and the planning board was that if you have something like that and you want to share it, it's best to put it in some kind of public place so that members of the public can see it too. So you know, maybe you have another, you know, um, folder on your website that says email that has come to individual CRC members or something like that. So if the public wants to see whatever this is, they could do that. And also, I wanted to say, if you are forwarding any of these things to your fellow CRC members, you have to be careful not to express your own thoughts about them about whether this is worthwhile or interesting or that we should pursue this or anything like that. You should not do that. You should only um, you know, make it available to your uh, fellow members, but not um, make any kind of comment on it, pro or con. So that's, I guess, what I would say. Thank you. That elicited <laughs> other comments. OK, uh, Councillor Ethe. Um, since I've spoken, I think uh, Jennifer or Pat, Pat could speak first. Okay. Jennifer? You know, I, I think, yeah, I agree with Chris. If we pass it on, it would have to be with no comment saying don't reply. So, but having a packet on the CRC website, is, is it, that's an intriguing, I think that could be a good, that that's a good idea. I don't know if we have to get together with um, uh, Samantha Given, if I have her name correctly, to to create that for that to happen on the web on a committee website web page, but I think that's could be a good idea. I mean, and if we could consistently put those public comments in that folder and not just the ones we agree with <laughs> or disagree with, we just yeah, yeah, Pat. I'm I'm a I'm a little uncomfortable uh, with the idea. Um, I can understand, Pam, why you put it in the packet, because it did only come to you. It was directly addressed to you and Lynn at the District 2 meeting. Um, and I used it to ask a few questions. Um, and that's not a bad thing, but I think that's how we need to use uh, emails that we get, comments that we get. If there are questions that seem like important questions to us, we can bring them forward to the committee. We can ask them. I would hate to have, I, I guess I'm thinking about our flag policy <laughs> here, not that much of a stretch, where we have to be very clear what the rules are and they always have to be the same. And I do not want to have a folder that I will never look at because it's filled with all the comments that I've already gotten. Um, I think this is a real slippery slope. Uh, if people are very concerned about having their comments before come forward, they can join us at a meeting and make public comment. Um, I, I just think it's it's tricky. Uh, what, and you know this, and it isn't a question of whether I agree or disagree because we're going to agree or disagree about all kinds of things. Uh, over the course of the remainder of the, the time that we're working on CRC together. And if we do it for the solar bylaw, why aren't we doing it for the judge -ja -ja? You know, yeah. um, I think it's a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Council Ethan. I think we could, upon receiving such messages, thank whoever sent it and request if they have not done so to send um, a message to the entire CRC or the town council. Perfect. Excellent idea. Okay. All those in favor, raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's, so we're going we're gonna to do that. We'll respond and we'll say, Love love getting uh you know feedback from you. Please do the following. And Lynn always, you know, directs them to that horrible form where you don't know what the subject is and you have to open it to find out what the subject even is. Um, but we could at least just say send this to the whole CRC 
Yeah. Okay, I really, I really would love to wrap this up so that everyone. <laughs> um, I have no announcement. One minute. <laughs> I have no announcement. Uh, future agenda items. I, I think, um, we will not see nu nuisance bylaw at our twenty third meeting, uh, July twenty third. Maybe, maybe we will, if in fact they ask us to make some changes. Um, well, it would be helpful if. If perhaps there were, I know that Councillor Ette and I are on both CRC and GOL, but if some, if, if, uh, Pam, if you wanted to attend when it came to GOL, that might be helpful because there were questions we, we couldn't answer, you know, that the committee that GOL couldn't answer without getting, sending it back to you, but you might, or, or you know, what your rep. Thank you. That's actually great. If you, if if the two of you or the one or the other of you uh, takes the time to let me know that, I would be more than happy to to be there. I, anything I can do to help, just sort of keep it moving. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, obviously, solar bylaw. Um, uh, actually, on the twenty third, I think uh, Christine and Nate Malloy have agreed to give us an overview of the University Drive and the design guidelines update. And, and I think that would be, as I'm projecting it, probably the, the first half of the meeting. Um, there's some good material and good conversation. Um, and, then, and then I would probably expect that we would spend a little time, if we could, talking about the solar bylaw now that we've done the hashing out. Um, I really wanna talk about next steps and how to how to make some headway on it. Um, frankly, before the, the state um, issues some <laughs> edicts that we that we would rather um, not have. <laughs> I'll be honest. Um, so nothing anticipated within forty eight hours. Um, I think that we are. Unless I have any objections, we're ready to end the meeting. Um, I think we can see everybody. Uh, all those in favor of closing the meeting, put your hand in the air. Can you see mine? You probably can't see me. Thank you. So the meeting is adjourned. It thank is you. Now. Thank, thank you, you, Stephanie. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you so much for helping us weed through that. Appreciate it very much. Take care. Have a good evening. Thank, thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Hey.